<laughs> I'm ready. Welcome back to another Turf Talk Down Under. I'm Stasia, and with me is Angela. Hi. How's it going, Ange? Oh, good, good. Excellent. So a few things happening in um, Australia this week. Um, there's a, seems like a lovely woman, Dr. Sandra Pertot. She's a clinical psychiatrist with, uh, sorry, psychologist with 45 years experience and she works out of New South Wales. And she's had a brilliant opinion piece published in the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Did you read it? Yes, I did. And I thought it was remarkable because um, the Australian, uh, what is it, Psychological Association published it. And they're like the representative body for all of the psychologists. And they have been pro-trans to this point, um, you know, which was quite shocking to all the psychologists that I've spoken to, but it was a real change of direction for them. Sorry, do you mean the um, uh, the new guidelines that have come out? Or no, no, I mean just generally that the Australian Psychological Association actually published her article. I think it was quite a miracle. It was a good one. Um, so she talked about. Um, the new guidelines coming from the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists yeah. that, are, that are taking a much more cautious approach to treating gender dysphoria in young people. Um, but apparently earlier in the year, she went on um, a podcast for the Australian Psychological Society and she talked about her concerns around the, the treatment of kids with gender dysphoria and as a result of that um, uh, apparently a group of trans people made an official complaint against her. That's true. Just crazy. Yeah. That, that's how yeah that's where we're at. And people with zero qualifications apart from a trans identity, no matter what that means, um, seem to have all this power over people with years and years of qualifications and yeah. lived experience dealing with people with those sort of issues. And yet, you know, this powerful minority can just cancel whoever they want. It is. It's crazy. It's, it's, um, it's like what's happening to Kathleen Stock getting essentially yeah. cancelled, you know? And um, Holly from Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. Did you see the, the Dr. Holly Lawford Smith works at the University of Melbourne here in Victoria? Did you see the job ad that came out? A few oh, days ago? Yeah, I did. Oh. I did. Despicable. Um, yeah, this over $100,000 a year for someone who an affer gender affirmation officer for Melbourne University, a person whose job is to affirm people's gender and to, to negotiate with individuals about how to, um, you know, impose their gender demands on everybody else within the university and even their parents and everybody in their lives. But like someone who is basically paid to facilitate someone declaring their trans and everybody bowing to them. Yeah, over $100,000 a year. And there was no specific qualifications except for lived experience as of trans issues. Yeah. There was also a very concerning part of the job description, which was um, assisting trans and gender diverse people with um, complaints. Yeah. So... Holly, it makes it hard for lecturers who, um, you know, just are remotely critical of gender ideology or even, not even critical, but are pro-feminist and pro-women. Yep, yep. I, it's, it's just scary. Look, mm. I really this, feel for Holly. I, I hope she doesn't end up the next Kathleen Stock. I, I, know, that, I, I know that she is um, working on a, a book. On, on, on this subject of gender, gender critical, gender identity. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is when that book comes out. For sure. Uh, these two things that we've brought up, first, um, the, the clinical psychologist um, and her article uh, 
and then you know this whole thing about Melbourne University countering you know anti-Tryon sentiment with this new position. The current climate here in Melbourne is such a mixed bag. It seems to be you know one step forward for women's rights, two step back one step forward, two steps back. And it's sort of coming from all directions too, which makes it really difficult for us to mobilise against some of the things that have um, happened. And also it makes it difficult for us to grab onto new information and run with it. It's almost like it's a, a gaslighting technique used by um, trans activists in order to just confuse us and have us looking in different directions rather than able to focus on, um, you know, repealing some of the draconian um, things that have come in like self-ID yeah sadly it does often feel like we're on the back foot and just sort of reacting to things um but what with the clinical psychologist um you know the psychiatrist the psychiatrist came out a few months ago you know saying look you know we really need to look at how we're dealing uh with gender dysphoric kids because affirmation isn't you know, particularly the best approach in every case, which we all know. Um, but, you know, the fact that now psychologists are coming out, it's like more and more medical professionals, you know, and I've even spoken to paediatricians um, at some of the major hospitals like Westmead in Sydney um, who are very critical of the affirmation approach. And yet where do kids get sent? They get to sent to gender clinics where mm. they're affirmation only. So even though, you know, the vast majority of psychiatrists, psychologists and people with awareness of, you know, mental health issues and gender dysphoria may agree that affirmation isn't the best approach. If the gender clinics, which are state government funded, um, say it's affirmation only, that, and that's the only place that most kids get sent, sent to, it's still only going to be affirmation only. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, um, and the new uh, laws that they've brought in around, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, conversion therapy laws. They are gonna make it even harder for, for private psychologists and psychiatrists to not affirm. Mm. So it's all sort of funneling young people and confused adults into this affirmation only process, even though professionals are putting their hand up and saying, we don't think this is a good idea. Yeah. Don't know what it's going to take. I, look, a national inquiry is really what's needed, but um, with all the health departments, all their time is taken up with COVID at the moment. Um, I just don't know when it's going to happen. Like, if if the Liberals get voted in um, at the federal level at the next election, and I think maybe after that they might start tackling it, but they're not going to do anything in the lead. Like, I'm not sure when the next election is, do you? I think uh, maybe a year away or something. Um, COVID, like it's like how many years have passed, you know? Nobody really knows how many, how many years um, we've been locked down. You know, Christmas seems like a couple of months ago, not nearly a year ago. Like, oh. it's just lost the concept of time so people watching this will be going oh these women not know this stuff and it's like we've been in lockdown for two years you know <laughs> we don't know if we're coming or going but during lockdown this is when these um gender orgs have, have sort of doubled down and um you know a lot of the legislation's been passed when we haven't really been in a position to um look at it and to fight it mm. yeah look i don't know what it's going to take I just wish the Liberals would come out with some kind of stance on it all. Um, but, you know, we've got the Victorian state election next year and, you know, some people I've spoken to think that because um, there has been a lot of opposition to how Dan Andrews has handled the lockdowns, uh, they're looking at bringing in this draconian law that will prolong the emergency powers indefinitely, like make them a permanent thing. And that's really upset, upset a lot of people. Um, so some people that I've spoken to are just straight up, he's not going to get elected. He's not going to be re-elected. The Liberal Party will win. Um, I, I'm, I've always, I've never voted Liberal or conservative in my life but because of this issue I'm sorry I'm, I'm gonna have to vote conservative 
Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't know who to vote for. Um, you know, all the parties that I would traditionally be interested in, which would be Labor, the Greens and even Animal Justice, um, are all, you know, massive enforcers of the gender thing. So, yeah, I think it's really difficult. But on the other hand, you know, there's not, no real opposition to Labor in Victoria and there's no real opposition to the Liberals in, in the federal election either. Um, nobody's really willing to talk out about this gender stuff because there's a perception that it's um, unkind and bigoted, um, you know, and, or they just pretend it doesn't, isn't happening. You know, women are yelling and screaming and going, hey, hey, over here. You know, we don't like our, our rights being erased and our, our name being changed from women to uterus havers and chest feeders. And people are just like, ah, 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 ah and ignoring us. Yeah. So I think we just have to get the, to the point where we can't be ignored. And I personally think it's going to be through detransitioners and lawsuits, in, a bit like Kira Bell and things like that. Yeah. or um, raising public awareness about what's actually going on, that 15-year-old girls are having double mastectomies. It's not just some rare occurrence. It's happening in Melbourne today. Um, and I think once the public wakes up to what's actually going on and this stuff starts impacting on them, which it hasn't had a chance to because of lockdown, like self-ID, which, which came in two years ago, we haven't seen the impacts of that because we haven't been accessing women-only spaces. And I think that once this starts to impact on people, they kind of wake up and go, hey, what, are we gonna, what can we do about it? Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, by then, it's going to be so entrenched. And that's why we really have to build the resistance. You know, there's a lot of people in Melbourne who say, oh, I'm opposed to this, but very few are willing to put their heads you know, online like we do, um, or go out on the streets and, and have a presence and fight back. You know, everyone's so scared of, of um, being doxxed or, or being seen as cruel and unkind. Yep. But it's cruel and unkind to do, what, to do what's happening to women and kids. Absolutely. Um, I've got a little story. I had to get a blood test the other morning and uh, the lady taking my blood was just making small talk and... She asked what I do and I said, oh, it's a bit controversial, but <laughs> I, I run a, a gender critical group. We're concerned about, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she says, well, well I said, we're concerned about the Im impact of um, transgender laws on girls and women. I just went with that short summary. She's gone, oh, yes, those poor people, it must be so awful what they go through, not knowing who they are and having all that gender confusion. And um, she was an older woman, like over 50. Um, and uh, it's just like that's the perception out there, these all oh, those poor people. And I think that's how a lot of people are and until they realise that there's this condition called autogynephilia and then the sympathy starts to dwine, uh, and, and dwindle and... Uh, um, yeah, that, I think that's where we're at, still raising awareness. Yeah, people, the people always say to me, oh, you know, do you know any trans people? And I laugh. The very reason that I am the way that I am is because I do know trans people. I'm related to them. I'm friends with them. You know, I when I was growing up, a friend of mine went through the whole transition process with me practically by her side. You know, it's not like, I don't know these people. And this is the very reason why I am against all of this stuff is because I've seen firsthand what this disorder does to people and what and that it's it's a lie and it's it's like um I've been exposed to a cult and I'm trying to warn people mm -hmm. because people join this cult thinking that there's going to be some you know wonderful outcome like people join every cult they're thinking that there's going to be some great afterlife or you know some reward at the end of the process and what happens is they go through this whole process and then there's nothing there's absolutely nothing because they've been lied to you know plastic surgery isn't a cure for trauma mm -hmm. I remember you saying to me a while back I, I asked you um Oh, sort of what, what was the common denominator amongst all those people in your life that that um, transitioned and you said it was trauma for sure yeah yeah for sure. I think it's 
homophobia, a lot, bit of homophobia in there as well. And um, growing up in areas where there were rigid gender stereotypes, like in the country and in, in the eras where there was rigid gender stereotypes. Um, but mostly it's childhood trauma, unresolved and manifesting in adulthood. Yeah, wow. How awful. Yeah, mm. it's not the way to do it. Um, there was another article came out just this morning in the Mercury. Oh, yeah. Um, which is a Tasmanian, Tasmania's uh, biggest newspaper, I believe. Um, and it's by some of our friends, Isla McGregor, um, Jessica Hoyle and Rebecca Crossan. Um, it's, it's an opinion piece titled Open and Frank Discussions, Only Way Forward Regarding Gender Law Reforms. And I just want to compare that to the one by the um, Dr. Sandra Pertot, the psychologist. Hers was entitled, Now I'm Hopeful We Can Talk About Teens and Gender. Um, so, you know, both opinion pieces are just calling for we need to discuss this um i just found that interesting that the two of them are so similar um but anyway um isla talks about um charlie burton of equality tasmania um apparently that's a, that's a trans woman i do believe he, she met up with uh, Senator Chair Cland uh, Claire Chandler to talk about um, males or trans women playing in women's sports. <laughs> and what Charlie Burton said after that meeting was, quote, until everyone accepts trans women are women, we are not going to get very far. <laughs> yep. And I just think, you know, sports, it is so obvious that trans women are not women. But notice how women are just asking nicely to have a discussion. So can we please discuss this issue? And the other side is making demands and saying this is the truth. It's lying and saying men are women. Um, you know, it's just bang, bang, bang. And we're like, um, can we please have a voice and opinion? We're being really polite. now. It's not working. What we're doing is not working. We, we're politely asking for a voice and nobody's listening. They're just ignoring us because the other side is too loud. And while I'm not um, advocating that we adopt their tactics, which can be quite um, you know, abusive and, and no platforming and, in, or, and any of that, I think we really have to seriously look at how we are um, advocating for ourselves because our voices are being drowned out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just not negotiating. I, yeah. I saw Helen Staniland said that a while back. Like, there's nothing to be negotiated. There, there are only two positions in this and they're d directly opposite one another. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Isla said a couple of really good things in that article. Um, she said, the reality is that the majority of Tasmanians do not share the belief that trans women are women. And I think that's true for the vast yeah. majority of Australia, not just Tasmania. Um, and she said, no law should be enacted to compel its citizens to hold any particular belief. Uh, just, yep, spot on, well done, well said. Yep. Yep, agree. Yeah. Um, there was another funny thing came up on Facebook. I don't know if you saw it. ABC Sydney did a post around period poverty, which is uh, girls and women not being able to for, yeah. afford menstrual products um, and doing without, skipping school, stuff like that. Um, in the post, they did not mention girls or women a single time. Oh, my goodness. And they talked about um, people that men menstruate. <laughs> idiots, idiots. Yeah. But, you know, it's the ABC. Um, they've fully drank the Kool-Aid, really. We need to find out who's funding that sort of ideology because it's an ideology. It's not based in reality. And um, just as... Uh, the BBC and Stonewall in the UK, their um, financial agreement was exposed. We really need to um, find out who is, 
is you know encouraging the ABC to take such a um, like a, a forceful stance on this because we look we don't want to be called breast chest feeders and uterus havers and vulva havers and non men and we want to be called women and girls and it's okay if you say women girls and non-binary people that's fine but don't erase us and they're not listening and we're giving you know rational reasoned arguments to why that shouldn't happen in relation to period poverty it's mostly indigenous girls who are being um you know who are suffering from this you know they're not attending school because you know the cost of a box of tampons is 35 dollars. you know um and in, you know and for aboriginal girls you know men's women's and bus- women men's business and women's business are clearly defined mm. you know it's just a gender issue it is a, a sex issue um and talking to people is not going to get through to them yeah it really obfuscates what's going on Absolutely. Um, in terms of who's driving this at the ABC, um, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but um, there is a small working group that has been sending out freedom of information requests mm-hmm. to people listed on ACON's website or government departments and taxpayer funded bodies. Um, I've seen some of the information that has come back from the ABC. Yeah. And I, when not quite ready to break this yet, but um, it, it's it's going to be quite explosive, I think. When Excellent. It comes out. Yeah. Because um, I mean, there are already groups. Um, uh, I, there was a right wing group, Advance Australia Fair, or something like that, that uh, put out a petition asking, demanding a. Uh, what do you call it, like an independent ombudsman to oversee the ABC and what's Mm -hmm. happening with all of our money that's going there. Um, One thing I can say is is that some of of our taxpayer money is going towards gender-neutral toilets at the ABC office, Um, (laughs) of course. So, yeah, that group, Advance Australia Fair, um, they had that petition going. There's another um, uh, Liberal Party member, a senator, I think, from South Australia. I can't remember his name. His surname is Antic. I can't remember his first name. He's got a petition going calling for um, some sort of independent body to oversee the ABC so you know there's there's already groups out there calling for this so when this story breaks like right right wing media is going to have some fun with it <laughs> um it's funny though because a lot of these issues like you bring up unisex toilets and also um ideological standpoints that can be um sexist you'd think that the unions would step up and and represent um, people that work in these agencies. But I know for a fact there's a lot of um, Victoria Police um, members who are concerned that, you know, so much money is being poured into diversity training, which is basically trans and non-binary training, um, while, they're work- while they're working with, you know, ancient uh, computer equipment, trying to write reports on, you know, outdated, um, uh, you know, office stuff like it's just crazy where the money's being diverted to rather than where it's needed so there's all this money for diversity training and nothing for essential items that um make their jobs you know bearable on a daily basis It, it just doesn't add up and i don't understand why unions and other um employee representative bodies aren't standing up Mm. questions yeah, Tra- a lot of the unions are really taken by this stuff. Um, I know the woman that runs International Women's Day, Brisbane Mianjin, um, she used to hold feminist meetings at the local, I think it was the Electrical Trade Union, and someone complained that they're trans-exclusionary and... And they got booted. They're not allowed to use the, those offices anymore for their meetings. Amazing. Like, yeah, it's happening everywhere. Yeah. But uh, we just need to 
need numbers of women to fight it. You know, if they, they can kick five women out, but they can't t- kick 50 women out. Um, we need women to be brave and step up. And men, we need men to actually man up and, you know, say this is not acceptable, you know, and it's usually men making these decisions too, you know, um, saying, oh, no, the women can't meet here because someone made a complaint. It's like, no, you, you should turn around and say, no, these women deserve to have a meeting here. These women deserve to be able to speak up on this issue, you know, rather than just, you know, oh, gee, you know, trans people and like uh, so powerful that they can just cancel anyone. It's wrong. You know, people just need to get out of their comfort zone and, and demand that we are seen and heard. Hmm. I don't know what it's going to take. Like I, for people like you and me, we see the seriousness of this and the implications for society, really. Um, and we're saying no. But then, you know, I have friends who they're aware of it, but it's not a pressing issue for them and it's, it's not something they're going to devote time and energy towards trying to change. So it's, it's interesting. I don't know what the difference is between those two types of, of personalities that, that understand what's going on and, but, you know, half of us will act and half of us won't act. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I think it's but I think it's also life experience you know I um you know I I, I work and and I work in an area that's women you know that's female focused and I have kids who would be potentially vulnerable to this this cult so I have a vested interest and so therefore I'm more likely to speak out you know I've also had the lived experience of knowing trans people and I've had trans identifying men in women's only spaces so of course I'm going to be loud and say, no, no, this is not acceptable. But someone who's yet to be impacted is going to be more polite or is not going to see the urgency of it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think you're onto something there with um, people having the personal experience of encountering someone, a, a trans woman in the, in the toilets or at a support group. Then it becomes real for them. It's no mm. longer this, like, theoretical just be kind thing Mm. then it becomes now hang on this is really uncomfortable and you're encroaching on my space yeah Mm. well well, we just got to keep plotting away at it I think and um raising awareness around autogynephilia in particular um um, actually transgender awareness week is uh coming up soon um starts the 13th of november oh great my feet will be sea of pink and blue (laughs) i've started putting together some informative memes um that look like they're done by say a a group like minus 18 but um and actually the message is quite different so (laughs) let's see how they go (laughs) the thing that concerns me about these stuff you know these inclusionary weeks and things like that is um Things like uh, Headspace and uh, mental health orgs um, and, you know, really important um, education department information, you know, really important stuff to kids, particularly post-pandemic where mental health's not great, is all promoting all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a shocking anecdote I found from a father of a daughter in um, Perth, I think it was, or at least WA somewhere. Um, His daughter started having depression. So he took, he went to Headspace and found her a counsellor. And after, I think it was two or three months of um, seeing this counsellor, she declared that she was transgender and a boy and he was just fucking furious, absolutely yeah. furious. Yeah. It, would be too- it comes out of left field. You know, people don't realise until it's too late. The kid comes home and says, I'm trans. It's the first interaction that they've had. It's the first time that they've even thought that it was, you know, going to affect them. So they're taken completely off guard. So, you know, I think... Um, parents have got to get it in their heads that this is all out there yep that's it 
I, I think there, there really is this perception of, oh, it's not going to happen to our family. It's not going to happen to our kids. And, and then bang, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, all, we all know that, you know, pornography is um, impacting on kids, you know, younger and younger kids. As soon as they get a smartphone, you know, they get sent disgusting stuff. And we know that that's impacting on crime rates. Um, and we know that that's impacting on self-esteem and we know that that's impacting on, you know, relationships between boys and girls. So, you know, parents are encouraged to um, speak to their kids sort of, you know, preemptively about being impacted by that. And we have to set, take the same approach to this whole transgender stuff and inform your kids and, and you know, like warn them of the traps. Um, you know, also to protect themselves uh, if they were to uh, mention a bigoted comment, you know, how not to, how to have um, beliefs that don't necessarily align with the whole trans borg, but to be able to um, stand their ground and, you know, do so in a way where they're safe. Like we have to sort of, you know, train our kids to be aware of all this stuff. Otherwise, it'll be your kid that comes home and says, oh, I'm trans. Now, for some parents, that's fantastic. You know, they think it's great. But even the parents that I know who have trans kids, if they had a choice, they wouldn't wish it on their kid. Mm -hmm. It's an adult decision. It takes years for you to really come to terms with who you are as, as an adult. So like, you know, I'm, I'm 40 now. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's never ending. It, mm. It's something I think that, that people are doing until the day that, that they die. You're still growing. And, you know, oh, my God, just to get caught in this trap as a teenager, uh, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. 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 I've been watching some um, detransitioner videos on um, YouTube because um, I, I like to be informed and I, I, I'm interested. And, um, yeah, there's been a few really heart-wrenching ones uh, where kids have just got into this ideology at 11, 12, 13 years old and at 18 or 19 are waking up to it and realising that, that, you know, it wasn't the cure-all that they'd been uh, sold. And they've already, ha you know, having the physical and psychological impacts of the hormones and the surgery, and it's heartbreaking. And these kids are so raw and real. Um, people say, oh, you know, detransition as there's hardly any well you know there's reddit subgroups with hundreds of, of people in the thousands and there's hundreds of videos on youtube about detransition and it's not like they're sort of um you know someone else talking about them this is the kids themselves and you can compare the videos of them when they're peak trans and you know looking forward to surgery to the videos of them three four five years later when they've woken up to what's happened to them and you know I keep saying it but it, to me it is a cult and these kids have been indoctrinated now obviously transsexuals have been around forever it, not in every case but I think 98% of young people particularly who um, get into this trans thing uh, it is like joining a cult yeah yeah and the only thing missing is a charismatic leader well yeah the, the, the leader is the internet social media and there are many um influences mm. yeah um, but yeah like that whole thing of oh if if your family doesn't accept you accept that you're trans then it would just cut yourself off from them don't have anything to do with them anymore come in come into our glitter family and we'll take care of you um that's cult like behavior yeah. and it's, it's predatory and it's just dangerous it's so dangerous and it's, you'll usually find that the family who raises questions about transgenderism wouldn't um wouldn't raise the same questions if they had like a homosexual child like it's not that their family are bigots it's big, it's that they have genuine concerns that your, their child who they have known from the moment of birth and even before is suddenly deciding they're the opposite sex of course that's going to make them freak out you know um it, it, to say that it's like homophobia is so far from the mark yeah yeah there was a detransitioner story, I think it was in The Economist um, this week, 
that was really good. Um, it's a poor woman. She grew up in a fundamentalist Christian household in the USA and you know, like Christianity in the USA is like so different to what it is over here. Um, I think it's so much more common as well to be um, Christian or Catholic or whichever. <laughs> but um, yeah, and in her teenage years, she realized she was attracted to other women. Um, and her um, her extended family, you know, rejected her, stopped inviting her to family gatherings because she came out as a lesbian. Um, she came out in, in her 20s, I think it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and then all her, her butch lesbian friends, apologies to lesbians that don't like the use of the butch femme dynamic, but I think it's useful, a useful descriptor. Um, um, yeah, her, her butch friend lesbians um, started coming out as trans and she thought, oh, maybe this is for me. And so she transitioned. She went on, um, she had her breasts removed. She went on testosterone. Um, she ended up, as a result of the testosterone, had serious um, 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 uterine and vaginal atrophy. Um, and then uh, there was a health complication. Her cholesterol shot up. And again, that was a complication from the testosterone. Um, and then she ended up going on antidepressants. And it was when she went on antidepressants that she realized that, oh, my problem wasn't that I was trans. It was that, you know, I'd never really dealt with um, being rejected by my family and, um, experiencing all this internalized homophobia as a result of how she was raised and it all came down to that and um, she said something about you know now I, now I have to go through life appearing as a trans woman when I'm actually female like just just really sad yeah that's but it's trauma always, every single time. And, you know, you listen to the detransitioners, even the very young ones, and they're talking about their childhood trauma, how it was never, ever dealt with, and that they just went down on this affirmation path. Yep, yep. Um, I've got a bit of news that hasn't made the news yet here Ooh. in Australia. Woo! Um, do you, you know the story of... Beth Rep and Bridget Clinch. Yes. <laughs> Do you, yes. can you describe it a bit? Because oh, this oh, this is a few years ago now. But this lovely feminist woman um, was very brave in speaking out against trans ideology, and she caught the um, wrath of a, um, a recently. Oh, you there? Yeah, a recently trans um, person. Um, she you know, caught the wrath of him and um, he decided to take her to a tribunal um, because of Facebook posts. Yeah. Now, um, unfortunately for her, her friends weren't as polite and accommodating as she was and they were basically misgendering this dude and, and you know, telling him to get stuffed and a few more colourful things. And so um, he took her to a tribunal for vilification and the tribunal um, initially found in his favour. So she was held accountable for posts that other people made on her Facebook post about this trans dude. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think it was initially all Beth Rep had to do was apologise to this trans woman, Bridget Clinch. And so she put up an apology on her Facebook page but her supporters got in there in the comments and were like, you know, this is wrong and, and said all sorts of colourful stuff. And yeah. Beth went and like reacted some of those comments. And so then what Clinch did was take her back to the bloody tribunal um, where she was found, the, the, the complaint was upheld and um, 
um, Beth Rep was ordered to pay $10,000 in compensation mm -hmm. for Facebook comments, half of which she didn't even write. Um, mm -hmm. So Beth Rep actually appealed um, that decision. And just last week, uh, the ACT Civil and Administrative Tribunal, ACAT, have handed down an 88 page decision, 88 pages. Right. <laughs> um, so we're trying to get word out to the media to do some stories on this, um, but I'll give you a little bit of insight into what they decided. I'm gonna charge my about to die, sorry. We've had technical difficulties this week, we mainly have. on, oh, just plug my phone in. Okay. I'm listening. Um, okay, so um, Clinch had um, identified 46 um, social media posts, but what they mean by posts includes comments. Um, so originally 46 were found to be vilification, but in this appeal, that's been reduced down to nine. So nine, and, and only two of those nine were actually posted by Beth herself. So wow. she was responsible for, was found to be responsible by the tribunal for seven comments that other people had made on her social media page, which is Facebook. Goodness. No, oh, it's just outrageous. Um, they found that there was no victimization. So that, that's a slight improvement. There was yeah. no other vilification, just not victimization. Um, and because of the reduction in the number of um, um, posts that were vilifying, um, they've halved her fine to 5,000, which is nice. Um, but, you know, it, it's still pretty scary that we have to worry about this sort of thing. Like we, this is a, I still see this as a blow to freedom of speech. It is, definitely. Because when, when um, misgendering can also be seen as vilification, um, you know, you have to be careful how you word. If, you know, if I was to say, oh, well, I actually got a Twitter ban for saying Laurel Hubbard is a man. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. You know? It's just a um, fact. <laughs> yeah, it's a fact. Um, so now I say um, I got a Twitter ban for uh, misgendering Laurel Hubbard. And, you know, a lot of people don't know what misgendering means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, changing the way that I would normally speak because I'm afraid of bans and being dragged into tribunals and all that stuff. Well, I'm not actually afraid of being dragged to tribunals. I welcome it. So, you know, if you're watching and you're trans and you want to sue me, go ahead. Um, but, but, you know, um, it is, it's a terrifying thing. You know, you need a lot of emotional and monetary resources to go to one of these tribunals. And most people, you know, it will be too stressful for them. Yeah, that's it. We, we really yeah. do, though. We need a Maya Forstatter here in Australia. We do. Willing to take on employers or whoever it is. Um, look, I'll just read out a little bit more. Um, the tribunal did find that discussion, this is a quote, discussion and debate on the nature and position of trans women, unquote, is in the public interest. So that's a positive. And, yeah, yeah. and it also found that, quote, calling a trans woman a man will not necessarily be vilification, unquote. Good. So there's a bit of leeway there. So, I, look, I hope the news picks up on this and um, mm. makes a bit of a de big deal about it. Um, I just, I feel for Beth, though, because, you know, she had a... a public job um on the radio in Canberra and she's left her left her job you know in the middle of this um you know and she's gone quiet and it's like it's clearly taken a huge toll on her yeah yeah and when you see pictures of um Bridget Clinch <laughs> you can see how incredibly insulting this is like you know <laughs> 
I see so much offensive state, offensive stuff on Facebook on, on yeah. a daily basis that just shits all over women, dehumanizes women. Yeah. And, and I'm forced to, do, well, I'm not forced to, but I, I just keep scrolling. I know that it's out mm-hmm. there. I know it exists. Um, <clears throat> so, it, yeah, it just, it just sounds like someone with way too much time on their hands and um, a bad case of narcissism. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And they pick on people, um, you know, they, they deliberately pick on people because one, they can see money at the end of it, but two, that they think that, um, that, you know, might not want to fight back. You know, Beth had a lot to lose. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and in a sense she did lose because she's no longer working in the same job and, you know, a lot of things have happened. So, you know, they, they, they tend to pick on people that, that can't fight back fairly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It, they're cowardly. I think so. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we'll see what happens. I did put out put the call out the other day. I don't know if you saw it. For we need an Australian J.K. Rowling or yeah. or Maya Forstadter to take on these people. <laughs> yeah. But they just need someone to approach a union. You know, if you're not happy with, the, you know, uh, ha- in, having enforced email pronouns or something like that, go to your union. If your union won't do anything about it, go to the media. Something as small as that can have a massive impact on this ideology because the media will pick it up. Mm. It's, it's not going to go away. Th- these issues aren't going to go away unless people start talking up. Yeah. Just give it, just give it a go. See what happens if you lose your job, become the next Maya Forstadter. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's funny. I, I've been um, doxxed and no platformed and I actually got media work out of it. There you go. So, you know, yeah, you know, not being, um, you know, if the worst thing that ever happens to you is, you know, you get uh, no platformed and you get doxxed, you'd be amazed the opportunities that come out of it. It's also character building, you know. Um, I was essentially silenced for three years by a a creepy troll, Um, not related to this gender stuff. But, um, you know, as a consequence of that, I started talking on the radio about cyberbullying. And from that, I got to speak about a whole bunch of other issues, you know, and I've got writing jobs and things like that. Now, this the whole purpose that, of this person stalking me was to no platform me and shut me up and it actually had the opposite effect Mm -hmm. it actually emboldened me because then now I've got nothing to lose and I'm self-employed too so you know my employer is fully aware of uh, my mouth and so you know it's um yeah it's if if that's all you're afraid of you've got nothing to be afraid of you know I, I mean if you can keep your children and your family private you know um then yeah I reckon go for it it's it's always better to speak up because if you don't you know the per- the next person won't either that's right I have um and Graham Linehan talks about this a bit but I've had I had the same idea I don't know if I gave it to him or we thought of it independently or <laughs> <laughs> but um we really need a coming out day for gender critical people where yeah some way of everyone who's been hiding in the background watching this debate maybe commenting in private groups it's time for you to like go public with what you really think on these issues um it would take a bit of planning and but we need something like that it would just keep speaking out people yeah 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 um, one other little bit of news, I got contacted by um, a journo from the Daily Telegraph, oh. Sydney newspaper. Um, she's doing a story, it's on hold at the moment, but, you know, hopefully it gets published. Um, I think it was earlier this year, um, Libra, the pads and tampons company, mm. um, came out with this ad um, that referred to not girls, not women, but bleeders. Yep. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. And I, I made a, um, a Twitter post a few days ago about being called a bleeder and it got thousands of likes. 
um, because I actually had a miscarriage uh, nine years ago and the, the horrific image of bleeding has stayed with me. And I spoke about how being called a bleeder reminded me of that. And a lot of people said, I hadn't thought about that. Mm-hmm. Yes, but I certainly so have. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I thought about it. And being called a bleeder is actually quite traumatic for me yeah. because that was one of the worst days of my life. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, people don't think through the consequences. They're all about, oh, let's appease this tiny minority of, of supposedly, you know, gender non-conforming people. However, you know, a lot of women have had miscarriages yeah. or, or worse or lost children and, you know, after having a child, you bleed. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about menstruation. It's about all that other stuff. And, um, yeah, it's just so awful that that, we have been overlooked to appease these uh, genderists. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and and look, I can see so easily see the word bleeder being used in the same way that bitches and hoes, yeah, are being used to dehumanize women. Like I, I can yep. just imagine it. Yeah. Um, so someone. I don't know who, but someone's complained about that ad to the Australian advertising standards. Good. And, um, well, yeah, but they came out with their decision recently, oh. which was, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with calling women bleeders in advertising. Wow. Um, so, yeah, hopefully this woman's article f- for the Daily Telegraph gets published I wouldn't mind contacting her and telling her about my story and my perception of it. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's yeah, it's not on. Calling no. me a bleeder, I, I'm not happy. <laughs> That's a really good perspective. Yeah, I'll give you details when we get off the mm. call. Um, yeah. Yes, all right. Well, any other bits and bobs? Oh, I can't think of anything offhand. I've had a busy week. We're out of lockdown now, so I've been um, running around. Yeah. Excellent. Been very very busy, um, but yeah, we're trying to get a group of people together to do some um, in real life action. So if anyone's around Melbourne and they want to be involved, um, yeah, let us know. Great. All right. Well, how about we wrap it up a little bit earlier than usual? Yeah. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your patience with my technical difficulties. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you next week. Great. See you, Anne. See you, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Bye.